going out there. All right, well, uh, that angel there is uh, wishing you uh, a Merry Christmas. That angel is hoping that you'll grab hold of what Christmas is, is all about and that you'll hold on to joy this Christmas. And the truth is, that drama speaks to what nearly every Christmas movie is all about, that we don't miss the spirit of Christmas. Has anyone noticed that uh, with Christmas movies? That it, nearly every movie is the same. If you think about it, it's some poor sod who doesn't understand what Christmas is all about, right? And, uh, and eventually they work out what Christmas is all about and they grab a hold of it and then they go on and, and live a happy life or do whatever they're going to do. And um, I don't know if anybody else... Actually, I had a few people in between services come and tell me that they too feel a little bit uh, like those uh, poor sods in those movies. That Because uh, I want to be... Um, open about it for just a second I feel like that sometimes I don't know about you but I feel like I'm that person that doesn't quite grab a hold of what Chris is all about I'm not saying I'm the Grinch or anything like that but I grab but I'm that person that doesn't quite get it and um, I was thinking about it just last night we were coming home from the cap dinner here which is all Christmassy and we would visited and we'd seen great things happen and Christmas is in the air we're driving home and my family wanted to pull in at some Christmas lights and what did I say no I don't want to pull in at some Christmas lights you know that's that's what I felt like and but I pulled in at some Christmas lights and you know what I said nobody gets out of the car you know that's not very Christmassy is it I am the Grinch of Christmas sometimes I feel like that as I say I had a few people tell me they do that sometimes as well and I sometimes try and work out in those moments How do I grab a hold of what Christmas is all about? How do I really grab it? Do I look at some lights a little bit longer? Do I play some Christmas music? Do I eat some more Christmas food? What do I do to grab a hold of what Christmas is all about? And that's what we're talking about in this series, Let There Be. We're asking the question, can we grab a hold of Christmas? Last week we talked about hope. This week it's joy. Uh, Next week, love and then light. Is it possible to grab these things and make them part of our Christmas? Well, today we're talking about joy, but not just a joy that is sort of vague and a little bit on the outside, just a good idea. We're talking about a joy that goes deep, a joy that carries on no matter what is going on around us, even in the circumstances of life. And to have a look at today's series on joy, message on joy, I actually just want to have a look really quickly at three people who I think express to us a little bit about what joy is all about. And the first person uh, is actually uh, an unborn child. It might surprise you that we can learn from an unborn child, but that's who the first person is, an unborn child. And this child is in the scriptures and this baby is John the Baptist. We'll pick up the story in the scripture with Mary pregnant and she's visiting her cousin Elizabeth who is pregnant with John and I'm going to read now from Luke 1 42. In a loud voice Elizabeth explained blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear but why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears the baby in my womb leaped for joy. You know if you ever needed proof I think that the Christian faith is not overly complicated this is it. This is an unborn baby. This baby doesn't need the doctrines of the Bible explained. It doesn't need lights. It doesn't need Christmas gifts. What happens in this moment? All that happens is that Mary comes along and the presence of Jesus is sensed by John the Baptist. And in that moment, John the Baptist as an unborn child senses Jesus You know, this Christmas, all sorts is going to happen. Parties and gifts and lights and music, carols, all of them good things. But it's possible that we learn something from John the Baptist here, that real joy simply comes about when we sense the presence of Jesus. And that's really all I've got to say, this whole message, is that joy is tied up in finding that person of Jesus. Now I'm going to move 2,000 years later to somebody else who I've been studying up the last couple of weeks who talks to us about joy or 
expresses something about what joy is all about. And I'm going to do a bit of a who am I? Now, I don't know if you recognize this person, not that person that's on the screens there. Anybody with me so far? Anybody recognize that person? Who am I? If who wasn't in the first service? Can we play the music while I do the who am I questions? He was born in Scotland in 1902 and died in 1945. He's a famous athlete. Do I see any hands? He competed in the 1924 Paris Olympics. There was a movie made about him called Chariots of Fire. And he's famous not for so much what he did, but what he didn't do. Is there nobody? Anybody? Wow. Not you. You got the prize in the first service. Oh, we do? Yes? Who? Yes? Who? Very good. Prize. There we go. Do you want to pass that on? There you go. Very good. I'm glad somebody knew it. Eric Little. So who's Eric Little? Well, he is uh, the most famous of uh, Scottish runners. Uh, he was incredibly fast, incredibly gifted. And uh, this guy ran um, incredible speed and with uh, natural athletic ability and the whole bit. And come the time of the Olympics, everybody's waiting to see if Eric Liddell will win Scotland and Great Britain's first Olympic medal, gold medal. So the whole nation is watching, but here's the problem with Eric Little. Am I, do I keep switching between Little and Liddell? I can't work. Which one is it? Anybody know? Let's, let's, go, with, uh, let's go with Little. I, I feel like that's got the, the most votes. Oh, the emphasis on the right syllable. Okay. Eric Little. Here's his problem. He's devoted to Jesus Christ. Uh, he loves Jesus. And he believes that Sundays are a day where I attend church and I rest. I'm devoting that day to God. And the schedule for the 1924 Olympics comes out. The whole nation is watching. And the 100 meter sprint is on a Sunday. And Eric Little says, I'm not running. And the whole nation goes balmy over it, like nuts, angry. Like they, he incurs their wrath. The sporting elite are mad. Everybody's mad. This is our moment in the sun. And can you imagine the, the decision that this guy's got to make? This guy's got to... He, he spent his whole life working towards this moment. And he says, what matters to be more then what everybody else thinks about me is honouring God in this moment. In a biography on Eric Little, one author writes that Little had decided, even if he faced a lifetime of calumny and ignominy for his decision, his desire was to glorify God and to obey God. And the results in these Olympics and in his future were in God's hands. I mean, really understand this. For, for us, it would be like Steve Smith not going to bat on the Ashes test match, right? Anybody feel like that would be appropriate? Or uh, Laura Geitz not turning up, gold medal, they've made it that far, world championships, and she says, I'm not going to play netball for Australia. What causes that sort of conviction? What causes somebody to live their life by a different set of rules? Instead, what Eric Little did was start training for the 400 metre race. Now what's interesting about that is it's a totally different race. Um, it's not all about speed, it's a little bit of endurance. And no one expected he'd do any good in that. It was going to be run on a Thursday. He lines up, he makes it to the final, but the American had broken the world record just the day before. Eric Little had drawn lane eight. Nobody thought anything about how well he'd do. But he had a secret plan and we're going to watch the screens and have a look at how he went. says in the old book, he that honours me, I will honour. Good luck, Jackson Schultz.
So where does the power come from to see the race to its end from within? Jenny, I believe God made me for a purpose. But he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Give him a cheer, ha! Huh? He won! Well done! Very little. Now, what has that all got to do with joy? Well, quite a lot. Man, you can learn a lot from this guy's life, and I have over the last uh, week or so. But right there in the middle, I just want to grab a hold of the phrase that he says, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast, and I feel his pleasure when I run. You know, Eric Little understood that God's pleasure was at the centre of his life. If he found God's pleasure, he ultimately found joy. It was God that made him and he, and he was devoted to ensuring that his life went along the lines of how God called him and what God wanted for him. And nothing else mattered. He was willing to turn his back on a gold medal uh, in the ire of a nation Instead of disrespecting and dishonouring God in his life, nothing else mattered as much. For Eric, when you find Jesus, you're not driven by the expectations of others, of gold medals, what the world thinks of you. But you're just driven by the joy of living a life for God. Now, interestingly, he goes on and he becomes a missionary in China, which was just as uh, amazing. He comes back, the, the nation's even more gaga for him now. But he says, that's not where my life's headed. My life is headed in serving God. So he finds himself in China. World War II breaks out. Uh, the Japanese invade that, at least that area in China. And we find out that he becomes a POW in, a, in a, obviously a prisoner of war camp in really hard, tough conditions. Now, Again, his convictions of what life is really about come to the fore because we find out, and it actually, we, f we all find out after he dies, but he had the chance to go home. And an amazing set of circumstances, a prisoner exchange program is on and he can go home, but he chooses not to go home because there's a pregnant lady who he believes is better suited to go home. So he stays, he stays in the camp, and we ultimately find out that he dies of uh, illnesses in that camp. But he lived a life of joy, living by the convictions that he had. And he could live his life living a different way. In his book, he writes this, It's been a wonderful experience to compete in the Olympics and to bring home a gold medal. But since I've been a young lad, I've had my eyes on a different prize. You see, each one of us is in a greater race than I have run in Paris. And this race ends when God gives out the medals. My point to all of this is that he lived differently. He didn't live life the way that we all live it. He didn't feel like he had to prove something to everybody else. It was simply between him and God. And that, he said, is what a joyful life looks like. Here's the last thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to call him some bloke. Some bloke. I'm going to read about this guy in Matthew 13, 44. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure in a field. When a man found it, and again, I'm just going to call him some bloke, he hit it again, and then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had, and he bought that field. So this is just some bloke. It could be a female. It could be a guy in a suit. But we'll just call it some bloke. The scripture says this, that in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and he bought that field. 
We don't know who this person is because he isn't real. But he's used by Jesus to talk about joy, about how we come across joy. Think about this. In his joy, he goes and sells everything that he has. Fifteen minutes before, he discovers that there's a treasure in that field. The last thing on his mind is to think, I'll go and sell all that I have for this treasure. It matters so much, but something happens. And this guy says, I'll turn my life upside down. I'll change all my priorities. I'll revolutionise my life for one reason. And that reason is a treasure. And with that treasure comes a joy that we're talking about here today. So what was Jesus talking about, hinting at when he talks about this treasure? Jesus is talking about himself. That's what this joy is all about. The unborn baby finds Jesus. Eric Liddell finds Jesus. And so did a guy in a field. And here is why, and this is really the why of Christmas. As Jesus spoke about that parable that day, he looked over all the religions of the day. And all of the religions of the day talked about working your way to God whatever deity it was that they were trying to find their way to every single one of them had a method or a way or a means or a law or a set of rules to finding their way to God but Jesus changed all of that Jesus said things are different you know for us here in Australia we don't really have um, the same set of rules governing us it, we might have a religion we might put down Catholicism or I'm a Lutheran, I'm an Anglican but here's my thought, I think in Australia we, we run simply by an unwritten religion which is I'm going to let my life be a good life that's what my life's about it's going to be a good life now that looks different for all of us for some it's that we're going to be good people for others it means we're going to be successful and achieve for others it's going to be that we see our children achieve but we spend our life striving and working hard for the unwritten religion that is written on our hearts, that it's really about us. It's really about living the life that we want to live. And the trouble is, when we live by that religion, two things happen. One, we don't live up to it. We don't make it. And we count ourselves unworthy. We have this set of standards for our own life and we feel insignificant and insecure as we look at our own unworthiness. And at the end of the day, we work harder. We live by fear. And the other thing that happens to us is we sort of get there. We sort of feel like we're achieving. And that only causes pride to well up because we're a good person. Or I've achieved or I've got money to mention. And we look down on everybody else and both of those things, whether it be insecurity and worthlessness or pride, cause us to look back on ourselves. But Jesus mixes things up and he says, I'm the treasure. He says, you don't have to live like this anymore. And Jesus says there is a joy available apart from all this stuff. Because joy comes from an entirely different source. So Jesus didn't come to this world to bring a new religion or a new set of laws, a new way of doing things. If you look at every world religion that's out there, they all lead ultimately towards some person, some sage, some wise individual who's at the centre of that faith and he points to a whole set of things that you have to do, doors that you've got to knock on, trips that you've got to take, the sort of person you've got to be to find your way to God. But see, Jesus is the treasure. Jesus turns it upside down. Jesus says, I am the way. In John 14, he says, I am the truth. I am the life. Come to me and find joy. In John 15, 11, he says, These things I've spoken to you that you may have joy and that your joy may be full. And that sort of joy is a different sort of joy. That sort of joy let Eric Liddell turn his back on a whole lifetime of praise and adoration because he discovered something that was different. This sort of joy is unconditional. It's not dependent on circumstances. Nothing can shatter that joy. You know, as I studied what this joy was all about, I found this one great excl explanation. It said, it's simply a calm delight. That's what this joy is. 
But as you travel with me, even in this short message here today, you might have noticed something hidden underneath. And I actually feel it really unlocks what joy is all about. And that is that there is a cost to this joy. We see it again in Eric Little. We see it in the man in the field. There's a cost. It's not about earning. That's, that's the treasure. We don't earn anything. But there is a cost to really grabbing a hold of the joy that Jesus gives to us. And how do we get it? Jesus simply says this. He says, come to me. In Matthew eleven twenty out, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. You might think that's not a great cost, but it's a cost to come to him at the exclusion of all else. Jesus says, if you want joy, come to me. And maybe to explain it a bit more, I think it's a bit like a child that's sitting in a tree and they're just a bit too high to jump and the father comes underneath and says, come to me. That's what Jesus is talking about. Let go of everything else. Let go of your security. Let go of all the things that you think will make you happy and well. And let go of your striving and come to me. So that's the cost at the exclusion of all else, of all other gods, of all striving. We come to him. And this is where I think we get it wrong sometimes. We think that coming to him is easy. We think that coming to him is not going to cost me anything. You know, the scripture says that there's two paths. One is a wide road and one is a narrow road and doesn't hide this point. You can choose the wide road, but it doesn't lead to him. It doesn't lead to joy. And the wide road is the road of this world that calls to us that there is a way that you can find joy that's about you. But Jesus says the narrow road is about me. Will you walk down that road? Eric Liddell says a great thing in his book. He says many of us are missing something in life because we're after the second best. We're after the wide road. He found something that mattered more in the person of Jesus. To get a bit pointy here this morning, I want to say this. If you don't have joy, if you're not sensing joy this Christmas, ask yourself the question, do you value the treasure of Jesus? Because here's my suspicion that some of us have found a treasure, but we treat it like a trinket that we found on the side of the road. We treat it like it doesn't really matter. We treat it like it's of no real value. It's not going to change anything about my life. It's just a nice little treasure that I found. But you know what? That treasure is the person of Jesus. That treasure for the man in the field said, I'll sell everything for that treasure. What Jesus gave was infinitely costly. It cost Jesus his life and it won us our joy in the finished work of Christ. He pays a price that no other world religion will pay. And in the process, he says, you are my child. You have incredible value. And when we grab it, what that cross means, we understand that joy follows. But we must choose joy in every single day. Henry Nouwen, he says, joy doesn't simply happen to us. We have to choose it. Again, for Eric Little, he he turned his back on a gold medal. He turned his back on the easy life and stayed in a POW camp. I'm not talking here this morning about being perfect, about getting every decision right. That is our journey and he has grace for us along the way. But I'm just asking, are you taking the narrow road? If you want that joy, you're willing to pay that price that says at the exclusion of all else, it's you. Can I ask you today, what price have you paid recently? What cost have you paid? It might be that you just get up a little bit earlier to allow him to speak into your inner being and commune with the great God. It might be that you say no to an extra shift that gets you a little bit more finances or you say, you know what, that degree is not for me right now. I don't know what it is for you. But are you willing to pay the price to walk down the narrow road that leads to joy? Because the truth is, this Christmas we can say no. We can refuse Him. Matthew 13, 15, this is 
my paraphrase, but Jesus says, if you turn to me, I'll, I'll heal you. But he goes on and he says, but so many don't choose to turn. This Christmas, so many of you won't choose to turn to Christ to be healed. But instead, hold on to the treasure in a way that says it's not worth as much as it is. You know, again, there's only one way to turn. Jesus isn't confused when he says, I'm the way, the truth and the life. He's making the point there's not a whole lot of options out there. There is only one option and it's me. And this morning he'd say, choose me. I am joy. I have come. Choose me. Choose joy. Choose life. You don't get it by singing a carol. You don't get it by coming to church at Christmas time. You choose. You place your bets. You cause him to be central in your life. You spend your life developing your life to glorify him. And it's not hard. This Christmas we choose joy. How do you say no to a gold medal? How do you say no to the easy ticket in life when you value something far more than what this world offers? And it begins with faith. It doesn't begin with money. It doesn't begin with morals. It doesn't begin with just good thinking, but faith and trusting in Him. And to be truthful, each and every one of us can start afresh today and walk into joy this Christmas. I'm going to pray now for some. This Christmas, I challenge you to ask yourself, what price will I pay for joy this Christmas? Not earning, but what price am I paying to walk that narrow road and be near Jesus Christ? And for others, it might be the first time that each and every one of us can find Jesus Christ this Christmas. Let's pray.